Your words, Lord, are spirit and life. The law of the Lord is perfect, refreshing the soul. The decree of the Lord is trustworthy, giving wisdom to the simple. Your words, Lord, are spirit and life. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The command of the Lord is clear, enlightening the eye. Your words, Lord, are spirit and life. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The ordinances of the Lord are true, all of them just. Your words, Lord, are spirit and life. Let the words of my mouth and the thoughts of my heart find favor before you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Your words, Lord, are spirit and life. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. A reading from the Gospel of Matthew in the 13th chapter, verse 33, 44 through 46. Jesus told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed in with three measures of flour until all of it was leavened. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which someone found and hid Then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls. On finding one pearl of great value, he went and sold all that he had and bought it. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. When I was a kid, my parents used to take me to the annual Easter egg hunt at their friend's house. They must have had three or more acres of woods down a steep hill in the backyard, and that is where they hid the Easter eggs, deep in the forest. They hid them in tall tree branches and beneath shrubs and under piles of rocks. So I would have to like sidle up trees and army crawl under the brush to get these really well hidden eggs. And it... It wasn't easy, and I was with other kids, but we would kind of all scatter into our own corners of the woods and essentially on our own. It was a little bit scary, but it was totally worth it. And after maybe an hour or so of egg hunting, I would emerge from the woods, giant grin on my face with scraped up knees and bloody elbows, and run to my parents and say, look what treasures I found hidden in the woods. I guess I thought that all Easter egg hunts were kind of this epic until I went to my first one at a church. I showed up and there was just like a field of grass with bright pink eggs scattered everywhere for the taking. Now I'm sure that was a very age appropriate thing to do for toddlers, but I was like, you call this an Easter egg hunt? Where's the forest? Where's the thorny scrub brush? Easter eggs are supposed to be hidden hidden. We hear in the parables of Jesus a lot of talk about hidden things, a treasure hidden in a field, a pearl once inside of an oyster, a lost coin who knows where it will be found, a pinch of yeast in gallons of flour. And we read these parables about hidden things and we search for their hidden meanings. But we are no strangers to this quality of hiddenness. Where is the manual for being a good parent? Hidden. Where is the trailhead for my next path in life? Hidden. Where is God in what I'm going through right now? Hidden. Ask Abraham or Job or Mary. The things of life and the things of God have always had an elusive quality to them. But some preachers still manage to treat the Bible as if it contained seven simple steps to salvation or five 
easy and obvious rules to live by, or three main points. It seems as though these preachers believe their job is to lay out a nice flat field with Easter eggs fresh for the taking, and our job is just to swing by Sundays after breakfast, pick up a few biblical chocolates, and go home. But the kingdom of God is less like a flat field and more like a forest that invites you to crawl beneath its branches to wait quietly for the hoot of the owl, to enter a world of hiddenness, and to learn to live with a little bit of mystery. In our string of parables this morning, we heard Jesus offer this one-sentence gem of a parable. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which someone found and hid, then in his joy he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. So a person finds a treasure one day, hidden in a field. They don't steal it, but rather entrust it to the ground for some unspecified length of time until the day they can go back in all joy and buy the whole field and the treasure with it. I've probably done something like that in a clothing store before, like taken the last shirt in my size and just like tucked it behind the rack in case I want to come back for it later. But this treasure, the one in the Bible story, in the parable, is worth selling everything you own to come back and get? You all are interpreters of the parables now, so what do you suppose is the treasure worth selling everything to get? Is the treasure a virtue, like patience or charity? As early patristics often thought, you give up all the sins of the world in order to have holiness grow inside of you. Or is the treasure hidden in a field the very gospel, the good news that God's love is steady and sure? Certainly this assurance is worth more than any bank account can hold. Or is the treasure hidden in the field Jesus himself? Not just because he is the best thing, but because we literally buried him in the ground of the tomb for three days before leaving everything behind to come and follow him. What do you suppose is the treasure hidden in the field or the pearl of great price? I will tell you what I would sell, everything I own, to buy a field full of right now. I would like to buy a field filled with buried joy. Remember how joyful the person was when they came back to buy the field? In this season of profound isolation and sickness and uncertainty, if I could buy a field with joy hidden inside of it, I would buy it and invite all of you over and hand all of you shovels. Joy, after all, has that elusive quality to it. It's not something we can just go out there and collect like Easter eggs on a wide open grass field, nor should it be. Joy is a mystery because it can happen anywhere, anytime, even under the most unpromising circumstances, even in the midst of suffering, with tears in its eyes, writes Frederick Buechner. He draws a distinction between happiness and joy, saying, happiness turns up more or less where you'd expect it to, a good marriage, a rewarding job, a pleasant vacation. Joy, on the other hand, is as notoriously unpredictable as the one who bequeaths it. Notoriously unpredictable, huh? Like that mysterious God of ours? We heard also today the parable of the leaven or the yeast. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed into 60 pounds of flour until it worked all through the dough. This translation is actually hiding something from us. The original Greek shouldn't be translated mixed. It should be translated hidden. The woman hid yeast inside 
60 pounds of flour. And probably some translator along the way thought, that can't be right. That sounds like an April Fool's Day joke. But that sounds exactly like something God would do. Something that I want God to do. I want God to hide yeast in the flour of my life so that when I've set out to make boring flatbread, the dough inexplicably begins to rise. I want God to hide pockets of joy in all my coats from last winter. I want God to mix new friendships into mandatory board meetings. I want God to hide bouts of laughter among the nursing staff and hospital wards. And I want God to hide God's own self, like a grown-up version of hide-and-seek in seasons of doubt and despair and grief. Pierre de Chardin said, Joy is the most infallible sign of the presence of God. So make an honest assessment of what gives joy. It seems that is where God likes to hide. Amen. Reading from the Gospel, Matthew chapter 13, verses 47 through 53. Again, the kingdom of God is like a net that was thrown into the sea and caught fish of every kind. When it was full, they drew it ashore, sat down, and put good into baskets, but threw out the bad. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come out and separate the evil from the righteous and throw them into the furnace of fire, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Have you understood all this? he asked. And they answered him, yes. And Jesus said to them, Therefore, every scribe who has been trained for the kingdom of heaven is like the master of a household who brings out of his treasure what is new and what is old. And when Jesus had finished these parables, he left that place. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Do you have a favorite song? One that each time you listen to it, Something new, tucked away in the midst of the art, sticks out. Maybe it's that piano run that you've never heard before, or that profound lyric that just touches your soul in a new way. And so you're so excited, you, you take this incredible music, this piece of music to a friend, and they just don't get it. Or at least they don't appreciate it like you do. They, they might say, oh, that, that's nice. But you know they don't hear what you hear. They, they've missed it. They've missed the craft, the timeless talent on display. Maybe one listen was enough. Maybe they just can't appreciate this music the way you do, but they just don't get it. They didn't have time to digest it. This parable in Matthew 13, I think, can be one that we read quickly over and we might render a simple message from. It's about judgment. But I wonder if we put a microscope over some of the overlooked aspects of this parable, if something more nuanced and beautiful appears to us. So we should first recognize that this message in Matthew 13 is not one Jesus says while standing on the lake shore in front of masses. He shares this in the company of his disciples. He shares this fishing story with the fishermen who have joined the lifelong process of becoming fishers of people. Why would Jesus share this parable with a small group of disciples? Perhaps it's more about who these disciples are called to become in this kingdom of heaven. It's easy for us to take for granted certain aspects of the parable. For first, we might overlook that this net that is the kingdom of heaven catches fish of every kind. Now the Greek here denotes that it catches all species of fish. And the concept that this net would include all fish, which in this time would mean all those fish that are deemed inedible by Jewish dietary law, is a note that we might overlook quickly to get to that discussion of judgment. But the first thing Jesus' parable does is describe a kingdom of God that is a net open to everyone, even those who are historically considered not kingdom material. 
So what about the separating of the good and the bad, the angels throwing out evil from the midst of righteousness? The word for wicked here in the Greek is often in reference to the devil or to this idea of pure evil. And this casting out is not about a person who is having trouble getting their life together. This is about evil itself being cast out of the kingdom of God. In the ears of these Judean fishermen, I wonder if this is an assurance that in the kingdom of God there is no evil. And finally, this phrase that we hear that at the end of the age, the Greek here is sentele ha aeon. It can mean many things. It can mean the end of the age. That's a good translation. But it can also mean the completion of time or the consummation of eternity. I wonder if we might translate it this way for our modern ears. When it's all said and done. When it's all said and done, the kingdom of God draws in everyone, even the overlooked, and Christ builds a kingdom of justice and righteousness rather than wickedness and evil. When it's all said and done. Perhaps this first parable is the promise that shapes the message of the second parable here. In this one, Jesus calls these poor fishermen scribes trained in the kingdom of heaven, and he charges them to bring out their treasure. We've been talking a lot about treasure today, both new and old. Now we should pause. The literacy rate in Jesus' day was not very high. Some estimates are around 10% or lower or maybe a little bit higher. And fishermen were not the best educated in Jesus' day, at least not when it comes to reading. And so it's very possible that many of Jesus' followers, including, including Peter and Simon and John and James, could have been illiterate. And scribes in Jesus' day were these honored and trusted readers and writers who were entrusted to copy legal documents, to write official statements from authority, but most importantly, to write and copy down religious wisdom and truth. And Jesus has the audacity to look at this group, some of whom may be illiterate, and call them scribes of the kingdom of God. Jesus entrusts them with wisdom, with truth, with the grace that he is sharing through his teachings, and he asks them to hold on to these old and new treasures like scribes entrusted with a wonderful message. What effect might, might, might this parable have on the lives of these disciples, on their calling? My wife Jenny and I are engrossed in these makeover shows, whether they be, whether they be home makeover shows, um, or, or personal makeover shows, and often when the specialists who are trying to help this person get, get redone or get their house redone, get started, they ask what the end goal is. And the answer is never, well, we just want a bunch of nice clothes in our closet, or we just want new appliances. Often the end goal is something far more beautiful. It's, we want to feel confident in ourselves, or I want my guests to feel comfortable in my home. And the designers shape their work around this end goal. In Christianity, we have a word for this. It's called telos. It means the ultimate aim, the end. So perhaps Jesus shares these two parables together to cast a vision of the kingdom of God, kingdom of heaven's ultimate aim. And then he invites his disciples, caught up in this vision, to ponder the treasures they've inherited and the ones they're finding in his teaching. Jesus says, I now make you scholars of the kingdom of God. Examine the treasures before you, those you've had before and those that I give you. And how do these treasures help you become a citizen of this kingdom of heaven? What values would we treasure? How would we treasure people? What demands on our time would take precedent if we began this project that Jesus poses to his disciples? If the kingdom of God is as wonderful and as powerful as all these parables we've discussed today, how will we be its scribes, examining and sharing the treasures that we find in pursuing it? I wonder if a good starting point might be found in one of the scribes of the Methodist faith, one of the great wisdom set keepers, John Wesley. In his pursuit of discipleship, he says this, he says, do all 
the good you can, in all the ways you can, to all the souls you can, everywhere you can, at all times that you can, with all the zeal you can, as long as ever you can. Maybe that's some treasure for us to hold in our hearts as we pursue the ultimate aim of the kingdom of God. And as you come across pearls and treasure in the fields, and as you collect mustard seed moments of faith, how in this moment, in this act, is this value helping to shape you and me and us into citizens of the righteous and just kingdom of heaven?